Hi everyone. Welcome back to the Heart of God Fellowship Thursday night service. I'm trying to adjust this camera just a little bit. There we are. I hope everyone's enjoying their week. I hope everyone is taking advantage of being able to stay inside and that you're staying safe. In case you forgot, in two weeks time on May 21st, because that's two weeks from today, we will be back, hi Andrea, we will be back in the building. And I'm so excited, I can't wait to get back into the building and back into a more normal time at church. So what we're going to talk about tonight is glory to God. That's what I'm titling the message if you're taking notes. And we're going to start in Luke chapter 2, verse 12, in the Amplified. I like the Amplified Classic. I always have. And this week is going to be a little different. Because to be perfectly honest with you, I don't have as exhaustive a set of notes as usual. So if I ramble and rant a little more, that's what I'm blaming it on. But in Luke... Chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among men, with whom he is well pleased, men of good will of his favor. The traditional way they say it is, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, good will to men. And throughout the Bible, we are told about God's glory. Moses, when he was leading the people of Israel through the desert, on their way to the promised land. Moses asked God to see his glory and to see his face. But he wasn't allowed to. But all he but God let him see the back of him as he walked away. And that was a glorious sight that inspired a song in the book of Exodus. I don't have it down here, but it's worth reading. At Christmas, we often say the phrase I just quoted from Luke chapter two, glory to God in the highest. There are songs about it. Gloria in at Chelsea's Deo, which is Latin for something that I don't know. In the King James Version of the Bible, the words glory and God appear in the same verses about 88 times, if the internet is to be trusted. In the version of the Bible I like to use for preaching, which is the Amplified Classic, it's used 123 times. But in fairness, the translation I like uh, is a wordier translation. It's a little more exhaustive. But what, for all the times that the word glory and God comes together, what does glory to God mean? And how do we live a life as Christians that brings glory to God? Well, that's what I want to talk about tonight. We know from Hebrews 1.3, that Jesus is the complete manifestation of God's glory. His glory is seen in his power and his authority. Romans 1 tells us that God's glory can be seen in all of creation. When, for me, when I look up at the stars in the night sky, my wife and I were out on the back porch last night. We had a fire going, and, we, and the moon was so bright. I saw someone say it was a super moon. But the moon was so bright and you could see some of the stars. And for me, it just makes me marvel at God's creation to take those moments like that. I marvel at how God stretched the stars by the span of his hand, according to the Bible. And to think that if you trust parts of science that the light that comes from those stars travels at 300 million meters per second. And it still takes that light years to get to where we see it and we see what's happening because it's so far away. I can't wrap my head around it. And to be perfectly honest, I've stopped trying because it gives me a headache. That 
is as much a part of the glory of God as telling other people about God's glory. Hi, Joyce. A big part of what I want to explore and what I hope to try to explain, or at least begin to dig into, is how much freedom there is, hi Jeff, in living a life that brings glory to God. To start, I want to break down the phrase, glory to God, because we say it to each other. And sometimes we say it to God if we're praising. I know David said it in the Psalms an awful lot. He would say glory to God. I'm sorry that I don't have any verse references for it. But I know that that's something we say, to God be the glory. I can't think of how many songs I grew up singing during worship that talked about the glory of God. And we still do. But why do we do that? Because God is as glorious as he is going to be. Me saying all glory to God does absolutely nothing to add to how glorious he already is. But what it does do is it brings me a greater understanding of how glorious God is. It makes me realize how much his glory encompasses and how much power he has. Hi, Sandy. It gives me a greater appreciation and a greater growing revelation of how big God is and how glorious and wonderful and awesome he is. So what do we look at to see God's glory? Well, we can look at nature. I already talked about how in Romans 1, it, Paul writes how nature gives glory to God. All of creation gives evidence of God. And in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, the first part of 4, 4a is what they call it, I think. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows and proclaims his handiwork. Day after day pours forth speech, and night after night shows forth knowledge. There is no speech nor spoken word from the stars. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice in evidence goes out through all the earth, their sayings to the end of the world. Now what I suggest we do is that we take the time to find something in nature, find something in creation that you can use to slow down and to focus on God. You look at what God has done for us, where he has put us, because the Bible says that we've been sent with a purpose. The Bible tells us that we've been put in this time, in this place for a reason that God knew. And that's amazing in and of itself, all of what he had to orchestrate. But if you, if you can't get a vision of God's glory from nature, think about the complexity of our human bodies and the fact that in Genesis, I want to say it's chapter 2, uh, it, God said, let us make man in our image. In the image of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we've been made and put and knit together. And he knows us from before we're from the time we're in the womb, he knows us. The Bible says he knows the number of hairs on our head. It's amazing. It brings us a greater revelation of how glorious God is when you look at the way he designed our bodies to work and how everything supports you. It's every part of the body supports another part. No part of the body can do without the other because they all have a specific function and only they can do that. And God's the one who made it that way. And if you don't like thinking about that because it's gross and it makes you think about guts and blood and whatever else, go to Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. We'll, we're going to talk about what God did for us. Paul writes, If then you have been raised with Christ, again, I like using the Amplified Classic translation to preach. If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, Aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above, where Christ is seated, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And set your minds and keep them set on what is above, the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. 
for as far as the world is concerned, you've died, and your new, real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in the splendor of his glory. God's promised us that we appear in the splendor of his glory, but think about what God had to do to bring us back into a relationship with him. I talk about it all the time because, quite frankly, there's nothing new in the word. It's saying the same thing over and over again because we're a little thick-headed and we kind of need things repeated. I'm talking about me, not, not necessarily anyone else. But to think about what God had to go through, what Jesus had to do to be born a man. He had to be stripped of his divinity, stripped of all his power, and he volunteered to, be, to come into the world as a baby as a human, and to live a human life, and to live it perfectly, to never sin in thought, word, or deed, and still... All right, I'm back. Had a moment, folks. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with me. A little network outage. We're all right. But think about what God had to go through just for us to be put back into a right relationship with Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God came as Christ on the earth, and he died for us so that we can enter a right relationship with him and be made righteous through him, through our faith. And we can't forget how much freedom we have in our life in Christ. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, he talks about how we're dead to the law. He says, and you who were dead in trespasses and in the circumcision of your uncir I'm sorry, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, flesh, your sensuality, your sinful carnal nature, God brought to life together with Christ, having freely forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled and blotted out and wiped away the handwriting of the note or bond with its legal decrees and demands, which was in force and stood against us hostile to us. This note with its regulations, decrees, and demands, he set aside and cleared completely out of our way by nailing it to his cross. God disarmed the principalities and the powers that were ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in him and in it in the cross. God instituted the law, and Romans 3.23 says that God instituted the law to show that we couldn't be right on our own, that we had to have Jesus come and be the sacrifice for us, to be the propitiation, the payment for our sin, and to free us, and that he wiped away the law. He completely eliminated it from our relationship with him. There's no barrier anymore. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was quoting, I believe he was quoting the last verse of Psalm 22, but he was saying that the law has been finished. Because when the law was given, Israel was told that someone, that a son was going to come. The root of Jesse, the seed that was spoken about in Genesis 3, was going to come and free them from this law that they had been given by God. And when we look at what God did through Christ, we have to look at Christ as our example to live a life that brings glory to God. Because I'm, I'm trying to, I promise this is all building up to a point that will probably turn into a rant if I'm not careful. But in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, it talks about Christ being our example. Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility, who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained but stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant or slave in that he became like men and he was born a human being. 
And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. A great summary of a life that gives glory to God. I honestly could have made this shorter into a devotional, but I decided not to. I feel like God wanted me to talk about this. A great summary of a life that brings glory to God is a life that's led by the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, a life led by the Holy Spirit doesn't always make sense to other people that were in the congregation of Israel, or even to people who were Christians after the Holy Spirit was given in Acts chapter 2. And we're considered dead to the rules and the restrictions imposed by the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses in the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Old Testament. And Jesus also never broke a commandment because he was still under the law. The Bible says, by the way, that God's laws and commandments are written on our hearts. So we, we know how we should act. But we're not bound to act that way. God's grace is always able to forgive everyone of everything, no matter their lifestyle. So long as they've accepted the gift of salvation and put their faith in Christ, that's it. What happens, and what I get frustrated with, is that get people get hung up on how they think Christians should act. But we've got the Holy Spirit living in us. We know when we do something wrong. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness. It doesn't condemn us of sin. We know when we do something wrong, but it's something that we have to learn. And that change, being willing to turn around, to repent from that behavior, that brings glory to God because it's evidence of God living in you. And it's evidence to the people around you. People try to impose rules on free people. Spiritually free people. We live in we live under what's called gospel freedom. We're not complete heathens. We're not hedon we're not hedonists doing whatever we want, where the attitude is eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. But there are people who put more laws and restrictions and regulations on people who have been saved, and that's called legalism. But there in the middle is called gospel freedom. And it's the understanding that Paul talked about where I can do anything. But not everything's profitable for me. Uh, everything is permissible, but not everything benefits for me. Not everything benefits me. But people try to make that decision for others that they don't have the authority or the power to make the decision for. They put, it feels like some people try to put more condemnation on people than before they were saved. And I love how God is the God of personal liberties and the freedom of choice. When we look in the Bible, it's in when Adam and Eve had been tempted and they had fallen, they had eaten the fruit, they had eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's not a mouthful at all. But they had eaten that fruit and God goes to find them and he goes around and he says, Adam, where are you? You can't tell me that God didn't know where they were. You can't tell me that God didn't already know that they had fallen. But God loves, loved them and loves us enough to let us choose how to respond. God loved Adam and Eve enough to let them lie. And he loves us enough to let us do that. He won't ever force us to do any of it. I can't emphasize that enough. Because Christians are being known more for what they hate than what they love. Where God is the God of love. The two rules and restrictions that we live by are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> and if you're living like that, you're living a life that follows the leading of the Holy Spirit. I told you I was going to rant. In Colossians, we're going to go back to Colossians chapter 2, but this time it's verses 16 through 18. And here Paul defends liberties. He says, Therefore let no one sit in judgment on you in matters of food and drink, 
or with regard to a feast day or a new moon or a Sabbath. Such things are only the shadow of things that are to come, and they have only a symbolic value. But the reality, the substance, the solid fact of what, what, what is foreshadowed, the body of it, belongs to Christ. Let no one defraud you by acting as an umpire and declaring you unworthy and disqualifying you for the prize. I'm going to say that again. Let no one defraud you by acting as an umpire and declaring you unworthy and disqualifying you for the prize. Insisting on self-abasement and the worship of angels. Taking stand on visions that they claim he has seen, vainly puffed up by his sensuous notions, and inflated by his unspiritual thoughts and fleshly conceit. People try to regulate so much. They try to make themselves, I, like, I love how this says that, they try to act as the umpire. And there are people who have been put in positions where they are supposed to do that. The pastor, prophet, teacher, preacher, and evangelist. I think those are the five major areas of ministry. Maybe I missed one. Forgive me if I did. It's in Ephesians. <clears throat> but those are people who have been given authority over the body. And God has given them an anointing to do that job. Pastor Bob knows when we're supposed to do something a certain way because God has given him the vision for this church. He has the authority to do that. But if Pastor Bob ever told us to do something that was ungodly or he tried to take too much control over the way people live their lives, he would be wrong. Now, I thank God that we have a grace-filled pastor who knows what he is supposed to do and how he is supposed to do it. It makes I love serving under Pastor Bob. I love having him as my pastor. And the way that he lives brings glory to God because he just tries to look like Jesus the best that he can. And that's what we try to do. People try to regulate the way that people pray, who they pray to, what gives them pleasure, who they hang around with. And you can't, you can't do that. You have to let that person either come to you and ask or pray that God would show them if you feel they're wrong. The Bible, and if you're being led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will tell you when it is your job to intervene in those situations. Romans 14, 17 through 18 says, After all, the kingdom of God is not a matter of getting the food and drink one likes, but is, instead it is righteousness, that state which makes a person acceptable to God. And I'm going to insert that God is the one who made us acceptable to God if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 19 through 21 specifically. They're fantastic. Okay, backing up a bit. But instead it is the righteousness, that state which makes a person acceptable to God, and heart peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who serves Christ in this way is acceptable and pleasing to God and is approved by men. God has given us Oh, and one more verse real quick. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, So then whatever you eat or drink or whatever you may do, do all for the honor and the glory of God. And I talked about this in the devotional I put up this past Monday, but it bears repeating. People have a load of different hobbies and jobs. Not everyone is going to be a full-time ministry worker. Like Pastor Bob likes to say, it takes butchers, bikers, candlestick makers, bakers too because I really like pastries. And provided that your job and your hobby aren't illegal, all of them are able to bring glory to God. Just by leading a life that's led by the Holy Spirit, I, I love getting to work on guitars. That's a hobby that God has given me. My mom loves working with plants. My wife loves going out and being outdoors and doing act outdoor things, riding around on ATVs or being out on a lake or whatever. My dad is amazing at photography. My brother, Jonathan, has skill with Lego that would make you think he is a licensed architect when it's just his hobby. Now, none of those things are illegal, but if someone was being hyper-religious instead of being led by the Holy Spirit, they would argue that none of those things bring glory to God. 
But what brings glory to God is me spending time with him and me raising my understanding of how glorious he is by spending time with him. And that's what I use that hobby for. When I'm doing what God wants me to do, I'm right where he wants me to be. And you may think that whatever you do, that God doesn't want you to do that. You may work in the supermarket. You may, your hobby may be editing video or uploading content to Facebook or you like to keep a clean house or whatever it is. You may think that God's not able to use that, but I promise you he is. God's able to do everything. And anything, so long as we let him. Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly over all that we could ever ask or think. We can't let ourselves limit God with that. I said it before, I've said it probably three times, but the way that we bring glory to God, the way that we give ourselves a greater understanding of how good and great and mighty and glorious God is, is by living a life that's led by the Holy Spirit. We talk to God because we're in a relationship with Him. We read our Bible because it's His Word, and it's a living Word that feeds us, that feeds our soul. Romans 14, verses 8 through 9, Paul writes, If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For Christ died and lived again for this very purpose, that he might be both Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Those verses don't say whether we live or die and do things according to what the corner minister says, or we do things according to the way the committee deems best. That's not what that says. It says whether we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. Now, I believe that God is able to take every habit, every, not habit, but every hobby, he's able to take any employment that you have. My, I used to work in a factory. I've worked at a pharmaceutical company. Now I work for a public university. And I genuinely believe that God is able to use me to minister to other people and to bring other people into a greater understanding of how glorious he is, just as if I were only working full-time ministry. But I'm not. I'm not working full-time ministry. I'm doing those other things. But being led by the Holy Spirit, you let God use you. I pray that some of this at least made sense, that it wasn't just some big, long, garrulous rant. I hope that it made you realize that God is able to take anything you do and use it for his glory so long as you let it. I hope that if someone has told you or your heart has told you that you're wrong and it can't be used that way, that you would disregard that and listen to what God has said. That you would take the time to get to know God more and to be in a more emotionally intimate relationship with him. Because that's what he wants from us. He wants to be the person we talk to when we wake up and go to bed and our constant companion. He doesn't want to be the person we visit for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning and then don't give thought for a week. That's not who he is. He's the God of everything. And how glorious is that? That God made everything and he looked down through all of time and space and he looked at you and he said, I need, not I want, not I think I should, I need to be in a relationship with you. I need to be your best friend, but I won't do anything if you don't let me. If you're listening to this and you're unsaved, just know that the Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. If you pray, if you know that you're a sinner and that you need to turn around and you need to start following God, just tell him that. 
It doesn't have to be a fancy prayer. God already knows our hearts. If you need prayer, if you need anything that we can help you with, please message the church. You can message me directly. My name is Silas Arnold. I hope that everyone is doing well through the end of this situation. I'm going to close with one verse from Psalm 19, verse 14. It says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my firm, impenetrable rock and my redeemer. I pray that the words I said tonight, and I pray that the meditation of our hearts are acceptable to God. I pray that your emotional intimacy with God would grow and that you would find yourself with a dawning revelation of how glorious God is. And then we take that and we go out into the world and spread the gospel. If you need, if you need to give, I try to say this at the end of every message because I forget. If you need to give to the church, you can go to heartofgodfellowship.com and it's a, there's a tab that says giving. And you can go to there and it'll tell you where you're going and how to give to the church. And I pray that you'd be blessed, that the light of God would so shine through you that when anyone looks at you, you're just a neon sign pointing up to him. I love you. I can't wait to see you. Two weeks is too long, but we have to stay safe. I will see you all in person on March, or on May, not March, that's backward, and I don't have a DeLorean. On May 21st for the Thursday night service and May 17th for Sunday morning. Be blessed.